with Marianne. I am so delighted we're spending this time here today. This show is going to feed not only your body, but your soul. Our first guest is Andrea Lieberstein, and she is an author, speaker, trainer, mindfulness meditation expert, and she's a mindfulness-based registered dietitian and nutritionist. So today, Andrea is here to talk to us about her new book, Well Nourished, Mindful Practices to Heal Your Relationship with Food, Feed Your Whole Self, and End Overeating. So let's welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you, Marianne. Oh, it is such a pleasure to have you here. And gosh, your book is just one of the most inviting reads I've had in a while. Oh, thank you so much. So I've got to ask you, like, what started you on this path to kind of explore not only, like, mindful practices around eating, but just the whole the whole health and wellness component? That's, that's a great question. Well, it, it started, it really started all the way back in, in high school. I just became very interested in, in healthy eating mm-hmm. and vegetarianism. I was a, a vegetarian for many years. Now I've added back in a little bit of other, a um, little bit of animal sources of protein like fish mm-hmm. and a little bit of chicken, but overall, um, I just was very interested in food as medicine and as healing and eating in a way, too, that was good for the planet. Um, I was interested in meditation even back then, and part of that was early influences. My mother was a, a meditator, uh-huh. well, a meditator and a therapist, and had an amazing library <laughs> of books. So I, I was reading a lot of those books on the health and wellness and my body connection and really living in a way that fulfills our full human potential. So when I, so that was back in the 1970s when we talked a lot about in, in the field of psychology and it was looking at how to fulfill our human potential. And that kind of morphed into um, positive psychology. So that's how I got started on this path. Um, I guess I should add that being in nature, lots of experiences in nature as a child and really loving that peace and that balance and that harmony that I felt in nature. And then discovered as well through meditation that the meditation could bring the same sense of balance and peace I had an experience that's in my book on on a mountaintop that really kind of crystallized this this place of this ability and this experience of of inner peace. I know it sounds a little cliche, but mm-hmm. just so profound. Really seeing that perfect harmony and peace that is actually available to us. It really is our true nature and our true self. So nature was the door in, and then early meditation. So I worked for many years in a very major healthcare system in Kaiser Permanente, Mm -hmm. helping Harold in mind-body programs and mindfulness programs, bringing the the mindfulness meditation program that John Kabat-Zinn developed, um, Kaiserizing that, bringing it to Kaiser, and so that's how kind of it, it all started, just seeing how important it was for my life and wanting to bring it, seeing people around me, seeing, I, I remember a neighbor in those early days and how much suffering and pain she was in and wanting to, to share, to share this, these practices with others. <laughs> so oh, yeah. to help their suffering. So it was really coming from that place of, how do I help? You know, how do I make a difference in this world? And knowing what this this place can do for me in my life, in this place of, of balance and peace that I can tap into in the midst of all these changing circumstances, I wanted to bring that to others. And so over the years, I was involved in, as I said, developing and bringing many mm-hmm. uh, 
therapy and in the mindfulness program to Kaiser. And that was very, very rewarding. And that fit with, I have a degree in public health, master's degree, and I'm a, a nutritionist and a mindful coach. And so it really fit with that vision of public health and our training of really helping bring health and wellness and change on a bigger scale. Well, and it seems like this work is, this book is just such a perfect fit with what you've been doing and kind of moving more in the direction where you're hitting, you know, you're able to reach out to more people in regards to mindful practice. And so when it comes to food, I know because you, you talk about feeding your whole self and, and overeating, which seems to be a problem that most people are kind of, um, going through. I mean, if, if someone has a problem with food, it's usually, um, you know, they're, they're doing, they're having a relationship with food that's not really feeding their soul. Right, right. And so how my work really began to focus on, on mindfulness and mindful eating was when I uh, became an instructor and a consultant in a funded study on mindful eating. And I love the work. For me, it brought together my many years of being a mindfulness meditation teacher and, you know, and a nutritionist and brought it together in a way that I could really make some of the, one of the biggest differences in people's lives and really helping decrease suffering around food. So the transformation that I saw, you know, through this program and then as I began to really focus on working individually with people in this way and then really extending my teaching, um, it's just, you know, what is possible through awareness, through bringing mindfulness and these mindful practices with certainly introspection and self-reflection and, and intentions and intention setting is a big part of the book, really an important part of staying on track. Um, it's, yeah, it's just really, really amazing work. What is possible for transformation and coming out of suffering? So, so kind of back to your, to your question. Yeah, so this book, as I continue to work with people and really bringing my, that full mind body background and healthy lifestyle and wellness background, this turning to food that so many people do as the go-to places for for comfort, for soothing, for even numbing out of feeling, like challenging emotions or stress is very common. So you talk about balancing inner and our outer nourishment. What does that mean? For a lot of people, they may think, gosh, you know, I'm doing really good with, you know, eating healthy and exercising. And, you know, so I think there could be a little confusion about what people really need to do to move, you know, forward to have a mindful practice. Yeah. So the, the outer nourishment is maybe what we're more familiar with. Mm-hmm. That eating a, a healthy diet for a healthy balanced diet. Um, and, and that, you know, the book addresses that too, that it is somewhat individual. People have, I'm sure that many listeners, and not, you know, not everyone, but many people have tried diets often on, tried to fit them into their lifestyle, into their, their, their needs, their preferences. But it does, it's very external and it's not really honoring what people may really need, what they like, what brings them joy, and it's not sustainable. Generally, I, you know, I, I know what you're talking about because a lot of times if we think, you remember when they first came out with the rice crackers, you know, and people were talking mm-hmm. about how that really tasted like siding. You know, it was, was like, they're awful, they're awful tasting. And I, w- I can remember working with people who would, like, begrudgingly eat them because they were like, oh, it's healthy for me, i got to eat this, you know. And having absolutely zero joy in the experience because they absolutely hated it, but they were doing it because they thought it would help them physically. Right, exactly. So there's all these kind of rules and guidelines of, you know, how much we should exercise and how we should eat. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of them are based 
The ones that are based on science, yes, great. But how do we, and sleep, that's really important, sleep, exercise, nutrition, all these things are really fundamental. But rather than adopt something that doesn't fit you, what the, the inner nourishment part of it is, there, it's really twofold or threefold. So the first is finding that wise relationship to those nutrition guidelines, evidence-based nutrition guidelines, exercise, sleep. What works for you? How can you make this sustainable so that you can live a healthy, balanced life and be nourished by these lifestyle habits? But then the inner nourishment is, and there's a lot in the book on this, one mm-hmm. is developing that mindful awareness, that compassionate non-judging way of being with oneself and one's experience and others kindness kind way of being and that takes some practice Mm -hmm. and formal some formal meditation practice is the best training ground for this we can also bring we can learn to cultivate this way of paying attention this awareness this way of being with ourselves through through mindfulness practice, but also through, through the formal practice, but also through the moments of our life in mindful check-ins, in learning to eat mindfully, learning to eat with the, with our full, present, oriented attention, paying attention with all our senses, eating in a way that comes not out of automatically responding to eating triggers, which we spend time on in the book we're like looking at what are your eating triggers. There are so many. And often we're on automatic pilot and we're just, next thing we know, we're halfway down a bag of chips that we didn't really want just because mm-hmm. it was there. Or maybe we were feeling stressed and we, or unsettled. We walked by the staff room. There was some donuts sitting on the table. Didn't think about it. Took a donut. Maybe you were feeling bad and you went to numb with food. So there's just so many triggers. Emotional external. So mindful awareness helps us to become aware of what our triggers are, what we're truly hungry for, and that doesn't just mean food. It might be might be other things as well. And be able to eat in a way that is truly nourishing for oneself. You really need. So that mindful awareness is really key. And in my book I have this image of a well nourished bowl. That kind of represents our life and all the different, we're so multifaceted, there's so many areas that each of us have that that thrive on nourishment and that what that nourishment looks like is a little different for each person. But when we're fully nourished, we're more resilient, we don't need to turn to food to fill those holes or those voids or as coping mechanisms. And surrounding this image of the bowl is is mindfulness, is mindful awareness, with kindness, with compassion, with non-judgment. So it's such an important place to be in too, because it's so easy to get into, you know, eating something and then just belittling ourselves, going, "Gosh, I should have eaten that," or you know, "I could have done better on my mindfulness practice." and and be more present. Right, right. That that judging voice, that inner critic is so ubiquitous. And that actually can lead some people to eat more. Like, oh, I've blown it. I I shouldn't have had that brownie. I may as well eat the whole package. <laughs> so yeah. bringing awareness to these kinds of beliefs, habits. Um, this is also part of that inner nourishment. We have, a, we have eight bodies that I talk about in the book and how to assess our level of nourishment in each one and how to give ourselves nourishment in a way that is energizing, um, inspiring, connected to our values, what mm-hmm. would us to a really fulfilling life. So the psychological nourishment chapter has talked about how do we navigate and work with these judging thoughts mindfully and develop more of that kind voice and that kind way of being with ourselves. The emotional nourishment chapter has lots and lots of inner nourishment practices so that we can feel nourished from the inside out, even no matter what is happening, what stressful situation, 
changing circumstances, ways to nourish. It doesn't mean pushing away challenging feelings, but skillful ways to meet them and be with them. You know, one of the things, and you may have noticed this, and when we feel uncomfortable, when we feel uncomfortable emotions, challenging emotions, that kind of first go-to place is to resist them, right? to ignore them, mm-hmm. to just kind of just distract. Some people eat, <laughs> some people work more, some people uh, watch a lot of TV. But when we can meet those emotions with kindness and non-judgment, and there's many processes, there's step-by-step processes in the book of how we do this, then we don't need to run away. We're not resisting and in this welcoming and just being with, there is paradoxically a relief and a spaciousness that is created. We can be in our own skin. We don't need to act out in ways that aren't helpful. And that could be, you know, that could be getting angry at somebody. That could be saying unkind words. That could be being unkind to ourselves with the overeating when we're not hungry when we're just trying to do so it's actually very revolutionary because when we can learn to manage our emotions be with the discomfort we can really be our best self be our best friend to ourselves kind have other coping tools and to those around us i think a lot of what we see in the world the the anger the the acting out is it's from a lot of inner pain, anguish, judgment, turmoil inside and acting out on that discomfort, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and also not examining our thoughts and our beliefs. So when we can really look with mindfulness, how true is this really? And bringing it back to food, how true is, and here's a simple example that comes up in all the retreats and trainings that I do and, you know, the, the individual work is that belief that is instilled in so many of us, I have to finish everything on my plate. Oh, and yeah. That's uh, yeah. some kind of old school thinking. <laughs> it is. I know, Marion, that it is amazing how many people it still runs. And the oh. guilt that stuck from that and the discomfort. And so one of the exercises that we do is to leave some food on your plate. <laughs> and, and just practice being with that discomfort and challenging those beliefs. Is this food, if you don't eat it, does it really go to the starving children? You know, in, in, in wherever it is. I mean, many places in the world. <laughs> we all have yeah. different And, you know, some people actually that have that belief so strongly, they might decide, you know what, I'm going to donate to a charity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if that truly is a motivator to eat that food, but it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't serve us anyway. So I will say sometimes, where's the worst waste? Um, the extra waste that you may get from eating the food, right? That, mm-hmm. that when you're not really hungry, that have it day after day. If you do that, that's going to add up over time or the waste on the plate and then there's ways we can deal with that we can learn to uh, even start with smaller portion sizes and eat them mindfully we often find when we eat mindfully that we enjoy we enjoy more and we also have more discerning attention so we might realize well I don't really even like this anyway <laughs> um, but enjoy more and eat less well, I think there's a lot to be said with that because a lot of times, it, you know, when people are struggling with eating, whether it's weight or not enough weight or whatever the case may be, it, it can be such a challenge to enjoy a meal and enjoy what it is that you're eating because you it, you constantly have this thought process going on. So what are some ways that our listeners can better determine, like, what they're really hungry for? Yeah, so there's a practice, and, you know, everything is enhanced. All these ways really are enhanced by doing some formal mindfulness meditation practice. It just helps 
mm-hmm. to help them to let awareness, so to speak. And so there are guidelines on starting a basic practice. Um, and then I do have I do have some some downloads available for people that want to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, so so having some some of that some basic practice is helpful. Then bringing our attention in the moment, remembering. So another another definition for mindfulness that I have heard one scholar who translated from the original language say is uh, remembering to remember. So it's remembering in the moment of our, in the middle of our busy day and when we're seeing food or we're just that time of day and we're really hungry and say right in front of us is we're at a store and there's the, the candy bars and the chips and the kinds of foods that mm-hmm. typically we go to when we're really hungry or crave. And so they're strategically placed. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> Strategic. There's a lot of strategic placement in all this with the food industry. But knowing this and then pausing, checking in, mindful check-in, taking a few deep breaths. So that helps to, just even a few deep breaths, helps to relax the body a little bit, relax the mind just a little bit so the thoughts aren't quite as busy. And to be able to begin to rest more in awareness and really see what am I bringing to the table right now. And this is the metaphoric table because mm-hmm. the metaphoric table, we may not always be sitting at a table. Um, what is it? What is present right now? And noticing the emotions that may be present, thoughts, even physical sensations that like we may just notice we're really tired. Um, We may notice that there's some stress in our body that we have from maybe um, there's a deadline that we're working with or a situation we're playing over in our mind and we notice those thoughts. And maybe we're not really hungry. We're just feeling stressed and comfortable and there's a habit of wanting to reach for food out of that. So this space of mindful awareness helps us become aware of that and maybe take a few more breaths and determine what is it that we really need. So the book and, and identifying emotions and thoughts also can take some practice. You know, some people that I work with right in the beginning may be a little difficult to locate what feelings are in the body or even what they are. So all of this is practice. But noticing that, and then in the moment, there are many things that we may be able to nourish ourselves with instead of that food, if we're not hungry. And not to say that at times we can't certainly make a very mindful, conscious choice, you know. Mm-hmm. I, want, I want to enjoy, maybe, but I know I'm not hungry. Maybe I'll just have half of that special cupcake. Maybe I'll just try a bite of it and really savor it and will let myself have it. Um, so it's not to say we can't ever not eat when we're not hungry. So much eating isn't another whole set of strict rules that we need to follow. But it's being mindful about our choices, about the influences, about our intentions of what, how we really want to live and eat, and using skills and tools to help us make choices. And so then on the bigger picture of that question is how do we know it really nourishes us? So the book has eight bodies, as I mentioned, that includes bodies such as emotional, psychological, spiritual body, creative, our social body, our um, our intellectual body, our worldly body. You know, are we making a contribution in the way that is meaningful to us? That maybe, or is there something inside of us, a, a vision, that's a purpose that we're not really manifesting, and do we have a lot of frustration around that? Which might be leading us to eat, right? You can yeah, sometimes keep kind of perpetuating that cycle. Exactly. So we start to look on the in the bigger picture of assessing, you know, what is what are we missing? What would we like to bring more of? And as we become more resilient, um, so we we are more we're more nourished, we're more resilient, and so in that moment of the day. When we're checking in, what am I really hungry for? It may be easier to make 
that non-food choice if it's not really food or to make that mm-hmm. healthy choice for ourselves. Because we're also feeling good about ourselves because we're making positive um, positive steps. We're doing positive things for ourselves. Caring. You know, another important aspect of inner nourishment is nourishing with qualities, beautiful positive qualities that we can cultivate, such as mindful self-compassion. Mm-hmm. And practice compassion. We are not only kind to ourselves, kinder to others, but we want to take better care of ourselves. And, you know, I I actually experienced that it was so interesting because I consider myself I, I I practice the practice mindfulness many, many years and kindness Kindness to self and others is very important to me. It's the value and the practice. And so I considered myself a very self-compassionate person. But when I took a class, really it was to learn, to, to deepen my work with clients. But I was surprised to find it also deepened my self-compassion. So it, it's really, this is a lifelong practice, all of this. We can always deepen and grow. But I found that with some insights I had and really doing these practices more regularly that I wanted to take better care of myself, wanted to exercise even more regularly. It it just kind of flows out of this being more compassionate to ourselves. So if we can start those steps and start to do that, this way of being, and that includes those steps, expanding that feeling of kindness and working with thoughts, developing that kind of voice, then these other behavior changes are going to flow more easily. Yeah, it's such a journey once you start down the path of mindfulness that it's a it's a very welcome journey because you're always opening a new door to um, kind of a new plateau in your development every time you are kind of diving into your practice. I know one of the things that you talk about your book, in your book, is um, social nourishment. And I wanted you to share a little bit of what that means, because I really enjoyed that chapter. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was a, a great chapter. We always, in every chapter we start out, um, we have a little bit of the research. You know, why is this area important for nourishment? And so... Mm-hmm. We, we thrive. We are social beings. We thrive with social connection. Um, that also includes being able to be our own best friend, too. Um, and we know it's a, the quality of our connection that is really important. And at least having some. We don't have to compare ourselves to others, how their social network looks or their quantity or... But it's really looking at, so there's a whole self-step process of looking at, am I nourished? Are my connections nourishing? Are mm-hmm. they not? And also bringing that discerning attention. Because if we have relationships in our lives that are inflammatory, they actually, they're challenging. They actually are inflammatory in the body. You can find that through research. So bringing discernment to the types of relationships that we have, and also skills. So in that book are skills to improve our relationships. So mindful, mindful is me. And mm-hmm. passion, certainly. Empathy, we talk about empathy and compassion, listening, and a whole host of suggestions and activities and ways to expand your social network. These are fun, engaging ways really tailored to you so that you you can find, I think there's enough suggestions in there <laughs> that you can find ways if you're feeling that you have gotten maybe stuck in a rut a hole or maybe you're behind your desk too much and not out or connecting, ways to connect, types of activities, how to do the things that also may nourish your other body, creative body, social body, spiritual body, and feed your social self. So that affects our theology, our, our connections. 
what a great place to be in where we're not just feeding our body and our soul, but we're also participating within our community and, and feeding that as well. Yeah, yeah. So it is it's very much, it's an overlap. So the image that I have for this wellness bowl is of a, a petals of a flower, and they're all, they all overlap. Mm-hmm. They all, and yes, nourishing our community, altruism, volunteering, are great ways to make new connections. They're actually really good for ourselves, our bodies, and our souls. And of course, really good for the community. We're nour- nourishing others as well. Oh, and so often, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it, your book is just so delicious, and I, I have just enjoyed the time I've spent with it. And you know, and I think we have time just for your final thoughts in regards to, like, what do you want people to really kind of take away from your book? And what are some things that you want them to, you know, if you had like a a one takeaway, what would that thing be for them? I just want people to know that you don't have to suffer. You don't have to be a prison of your your thoughts and your beliefs around a food, around your body, um, that, and stuck, you don't need to be stuck. That there is, there really is pride and truth, hope and help and practices and inspiration that you can begin now, today. And this book is a great way of, of, of beginning that journey. And through mindfulness practice, through starting self-compassion practice, through, through bringing awareness to how our thoughts and beliefs um, affect our reality and how we can shift that and how we can nourish from the inside out with beautiful qualities and where we put our attention with beauty and gratitude and compassion and begin to shift our whole inner way of being while acknowledging that you know we are human we are going to have challenging feelings that come and go but ways to be with them so we can be comfortably live comfortably in our own in our own self, in our own skin, and also free up the energy that we may have had tied up with suffering, whether around food, other things in our life that ways to concretely free it up so that we can live the life that we dream of living, that we can live a fulfilling life and we can do what we came here to do. Whatever that is, whether it's raise a beautiful family, whether it's to work, uh, to start a nonprofit and make some huge changes on the global level or both and, or whatever mm-hmm. it is, local community, whatever really is rewarding and fulfilling. And that, uh, as a quick aside, we talked about social nourishment, it's socially nourishing too. <laughs> <You're> so, <laughs> uh, so that's kind of my, I guess, my, my takeaway there. Oh, that was a, a lovely way to, you know, end our time together. And I just really enjoyed your book, Well Nourished. And I felt, you know, I, I've been kind of working on my mindful practice for some time. And there were things in here that I have not really um, gone through and experienced. So it, it gave me the opportunity to kind of further my practice as well. So. You know, thank you so much, Andrea, for taking the time to be on the show with us today. Oh, and before we go, where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? Yeah, thank you. So listeners can connect with me by visiting my website, yourwellnourishedlife.com. You can join um, our, our Facebook community, Your Well Nourished Life. Mm-hmm. You can also on Twitter. That's all on the website. And I do have a, the first chapter, which is all about the eight bodies of nourishment. You can visit my site and receive a free chapter. And happy to share that. It also tells you how to order the book. And I also offer very accessible to help support and guide you on that journey through online programs mm-hmm. in wellness living and retreats. All actually um, internationally this time. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, and I know that they can check out more of the work that you're doing as far as your coaching programs and training and your book and all these great things on your website, wellnourishedlife.com. 
you, Andrea. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Marion, for having me. Well, thank you, Andrea. And for those listening, you can learn more about Andrea's book on our book club website at momentswithmarianne.com. We're going to pause here for a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com This is Jennifer McGill. My highly anticipated new album, Unbreakable, is now available at jennifermcgill.com. Everything from power ballads to high-energy jam-out-in-your-car songs, I used my highest joys and deepest pains to create empowering songs of love, strength, healing, and restoration so that you can be unbreakable, too. Get your copy of Unbreakable today from jennifermcgill.com. Because who doesn't want to be unbreakable? The highly acclaimed and newly released book, The Hand Part 2 by Lynn Van Prague Grattan, describes the journey between a psychic medium and a family who lost a son. Messages from Beyond Eternity's Gate is of love and healing. For more information, visit www.lynnvanprague-grattan.com. That's www.lynnvanprague-grattan.com. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted to be introducing our next guest, Heather Ashamara, and she's here today to talk to us about her new book, Warrior Goddess Training. Now, Heather Ash is dedicated to inspiring depth, creativity, and joy by sharing the most recent tools from a variety of world traditions. She has studied and taught extensively with Don Miguel Ruiz, author of The Four Agreements. She brings an open-hearted, inclusive worldview to her writings and teachings, which are a rich blend of Toltec wisdom, European shamanism, Buddhism, and Native American ceremony. So let's welcome to the show Heather Ash. Thanks so much, Marianne. Great to be here. It is such a joy to have you here. My goodness, I have to ask you, what inspired you to write this book? Mm, I've been really blessed to have been working with women for the last uh, 25 years. and Mm -hmm. just been really inspired by women that are stepping back into their power, that are finding their voice and that are reclaiming their creativity. And so the book came out of just many inner circles, many classes, gathering information, watching myself, and then wanting to gift women something to help them to get centered in themselves again. And move that whole part of them forward, I would take, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, there's so many ways that we as women have created this image of perfection of who we think we're supposed to be. And so this is really about coming back. I think about it as coming back home to ourselves. 
letting go of the comparison, letting go of the judgment, and really getting curious, who am I now, rather than who do I think I should be, or who did I learn to be? Or who should I look like, or, you know, exactly. there's, there's so much pressure on women that, um, that it seems like the fashion industry has on women that we should be a certain body type, or you should look a certain way, or do certain things to be considered successful, or to be a value, you know? Yeah, exactly. And there's this, just this, such a strong message from media about you're not enough unless you buy this product or look this way. And so that's so epidemic with, with us that we so often compare ourselves to what we think we're supposed to look like or to who we were, you know, 20, 30 years ago instead of really getting curious. Who am I now? What's, what's this body like? What's my heart like? What do I love? And that's really the, the main emphasis of warrior goddess training is, is learning to become your best friend and your ally rather than your worst enemy. I know that you also talk about how there's this also like this subconscious bias and, and the messaging behind it is that men are more important. And gosh, when I heard that, I was like, wow, there is some truth to that. <laughs> You know, there's some truth that we've been taught that that's how things are supposed to be when that can, you know, it's so far from the truth. Yes. Yeah. And it's it's so sneaky that we don't even realize that we've been taught that, that difference between men and women. But I just heard about this Harvard study. It was so fascinating that they took a – an application to someone for a job. And these are like Harvard graduates. And they, uh, the only thing they changed was the name. So one person was Henry, and then they took the exact same application, they put Holly. Mm-hmm. And people responded, like, Henry's application was so professional, and he's obviously very qualified for the job. And so when it was the same exact wording, but the name was Holly, they said she's um, making a big deal of herself, like she's overinflating herself, she's arrogant. Wow. So, yeah, whoa, it's, we still have a long way to go. And I think about it, you know, it, it was only a hundred plus years ago that women didn't have the right to vote in this country. That wasn't that long ago. And so while as modern women we have a lot of external freedom, like we can vote, we can choose who we want to partner with, we can pretty have much have any job we want, mm-hmm. that's relatively new and so what I see is that we have these external freedoms but we're not yet free on the inside we still have a lot of work to do inside of each of us as women and then in the culture in general to for women to be on equal footing well and I know in your book you talk about shamanic tools for opening not just our perceptions but our heart yes and I love working with tools that get us out of the mind. So a big part of the issue is the mind. Mm -hmm. And so coming back into the body and starting to look at the energy, how we're responding to things, what agreements we've made, where we're making ourselves smaller, those can all really help us to start to navigate ourselves in in a good way and to learn how we're being in the world without mm-hmm. judging ourselves for it. Just to get really curious. of like, oh, wow, I just totally stopped speaking. Or I just gave all my power to somebody else. Or I just made myself a lot smaller. Huh, I wonder why I did that. So it's that place of curiosity and exploration. That's what really helps us to unwind those old patterns and habits. Mm. Gosh, I, your book... I'm I'm so happy to have your book. <laughs> it's <laughs> such an inspiration, and you know, and there are so many resources in it. And it, I just love how you approach not just you know life, but like how to move forward in life and how to really reclaim. And you talk about you know like your inner goddess, igniting your inner goddess. Yes, that. We we want to be fiery, passionate, creative, full women, and and that we're all really different. And so I think about it like warrior energy is focus, it's clarity, it's one hundred percent commitment of yes mm-hmm. and in. And the goddess energy is openness, creativity, play, and as women we want to 
really cultivate both of these qualities inside of us and that we're all really different. So some women are more warrior-oriented. That's their essence. They come in more warrior. And some women are more goddess essence, mm-hmm. more oriented that way. Some of, some women are 50-50. But we're not trying to get to 50-50. Like, when I arrive at 50% warrior and 50% goddess, I'll be good. Yeah. We're, and I've reached, you know, like, the ultimate us. Um. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Like, then I will be spiritual. And, it, and like, like, no, just be you. And and find out what's your blend. And there's a lot of shells that we take on as women of thinking, I need to be more warrior. I need to be more goddess. We need to mm-hmm. shed what doesn't serve us. And then learn to use both of these qualities skillfully. Because there's some situations where that goddess energy is what's needed. And other situations, it's what warrior energy is more needed. Yeah. And it, it just kind of... I, I would assume that that over time may shift, maybe during different parts of our life we're more in the warrior and other times we might be more in the goddess, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's been interesting recently. I've been noticing a lot of women that are coming to work with me that have been warriors their whole life, and they're like, I'm missing that softness. I'm missing that open. Like, I've armored myself and I've pushed everything through. And they're really seeking a new way of being, which is really beautiful to see. And I've also had a lot of women that it's the same thing. Like, they're super goddessy, and they're like, I need some, like, some focus here. <laughs> so it should work. <laughs> it is, and I can relate to that. You know, you go during different parts of your life, and you're like, gosh, you know, there's, you know, if you're working in the corporate world, you know, you've got to wear your warrior, you know? Yeah. <laughs> there's and no it's choice. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, well, I mean, there's a role mm-hmm. rather than believing that's what I have to be all the time. Yeah, it's just a role we're taking on. Well, and it's interesting, you know, it, at least for me personally, I look back and while it was a role I took on, it wasn't one that I, I mean, I, I wore it all the time. I wore it 24 okay. 7. It's because I was yeah. so immersed in it, you know. During during that period, and I'm sure you get a lot of women that are like, and you were just saying that you're just like, gosh, you know, I'm so tired of having to be the warrior all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's exhausting. And when we have an and too much warrior, when we have an excess of warrior, we get dogmatic, we get brittle in the like hard way. Mm-hmm. We armor, we we push ourselves constantly, and it's it doesn't serve us. And so we definitely looking at how do we come back into balance so that we're in good relationship with ourselves and with the world so that we're, we're really nourishing ourselves rather than pushing. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of not having to be all one or all the other. It's whatever that balance is for you. It could be a 60-40 or 30-70, whatever exactly. the deal is. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. I think there, I could just hear a big sigh of relief all over the world. Women all over are just like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just I love that. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know in your book, you talk about purifying our vessel. And I'd love for you to share just a little bit about, like, what do you mean by that for our listeners? And why would we engage in doing that? Hmm. I see that each of us has four main aspects of ourselves. We have our mind, our energetic body, our emotional body, and our physical body. Mm-hmm. And for me, purifying the vessel is, is to begin to befriend each of these areas, to start to look at what do I need to clear up in my mind? What ways of thinking or ways of speaking aren't serving me? And that that would be part of purifying the vessel. Then same with our, let's say, emotional body, to look at the places that you have old, stagnant emotions that haven't been cleared out from the past and and how to purify, how to clear them out. So you're in present day with your emotional body rather than being in relationship with the past all the time. And same thing with the physical body, that we really want to come into honoring our physical body and seeing it as a temple. And so how do we bring a new relationship to the physical body? And that act of purifying ourselves isn't because we're dirty. It's mm-hmm. because we're honoring. I see that each of us is this incredible temple. And for some of us, that temple's been neglected. 
like there's dirt on the floors and it needs a good coat of paint and the structural sound, but we just need to do some work with love, with that sense of sacredness towards ourselves. Well, I think a lot of women, you know, specifically, they're so busy being the caretaker or the boss or whatever the case is. That, you know, they have people that they have to oversee or children they're taking care of or whatever groups that they're in charge of that they often forget to really focus on themselves and take care of themselves. Mm, so true. I was once talking with a woman who just had this revelation when she started reading Warrior Goddess Training because she realized that not not only did she not, like, think about herself, like, she wasn't in the equation at all. It's not like she was second or third. She hadn't considered herself at all. And so really starting to commit to ourselves, to get to know who we are, to really support ourselves because so many women are starting, are burning out because mm-hmm. they're in that caretaker role and everybody then suffers. And we need to, to come back into relationship with ourselves in a good way and then model that. Yeah. And we need to model that. Yeah, because otherwise, I mean, you can't pull. You know, it's you can't can't pour anything from a a cup that's empty. You know, <laughs> it, you know, have to focus in on on that as well. And you know, and it's interesting. So I I know you talk about also. And we don't want to give everything away because we do want people to go and pick up their own warrior goddess training. So I'm trying to be very delicate on what we touch on here, but what are some tips that women can use to connect with their inner goddess? To, to really, one super easy way, do more of the things that you love. So if you love going for walks in nature, if you love dancing, if you love gardening, that when we're doing something we love, we soften and we open and we receive. And so that really conscious act of what brings you pleasure and to give yourself permission to have more pleasure in your life, to have more play, to receive and to let yourself get full. And that sounds so easy Mm -hmm. and yet it's very difficult for a lot of women because we think I, it's, I don't deserve this or I have to put everyone else first. So start to steer yourself towards what, what do I love? What brings me pleasure? And if you feel guilty or you feel selfish or you have uh, discomfort around that, stay with it to move through the old agreements and it'll get easier and you'll find that you are then happier in general and softer and more open and when we're open we're creative and when we're creative we're in less drama and stress and everything in our life starts to work better and more harmoniously i think the major push has always been if you come up against something that feels uncomfortable you know most of the time people do not walk through that or breathe through that they're trying to find ways to get around it or yeah find okay. it or bury it, you know, (laughs) it's not something that you can walk through. So I love how you have that as the approach because coming out the other side is such a beautiful thing. It's a big transformation. And we, in my community, we tease that discomfort is the new black. That if you really want to transform your life, you have to be willing to turn towards the discomfort and go through it, which means staying with yourself, not abandoning yourself. Mm-hmm. And so we don't want to live lives where we're just avoiding discomfort because what that means is we're staying in our box. We want to break out of the limitations we've created, and that means a willingness to feel the discomfort as we're breaking the old agreements and the old patterns that we have. And it can be here. It's still going to be uncomfortable. But, you know, I, I remind I remind women that if you've spent your whole life not using your voice and any time anybody says, hey, where do you want to go to lunch? Mm-hmm. And you say, I don't know. Where do you want to go to lunch? Um, you know, I'm d- definitely guilty of this. So, <laughs> And then one day you read a book and you have an idea. You're like, I'm going to find my voice. The first time you go to speak your truth and someone says, where would you like to go to lunch? You're probably not incredibly gracefully going, well, I said I'm going to Italian food today. 
you're probably either going to blow up at them because you have so much repressed energy and you have to, like, push through the barrier. Or mm-hmm. you're going to go, well, maybe it's time. What do you think? Is it time? Okay, would that be you? You're going to do it in a big apology way. Or you're going to do the same thing and then get to witness yourself not standing up for what you want. So the process of transformation really takes a lot of courage and a lot of compassion and staying with yourself through the discomfort and through the awkwardness of learning how to do it in a new way. Well, and what advice would you give women who are not used to using their voice? They put themselves at the end of the line, and even if they are on that list, like you were talking about, you know, some people don't even consider themselves when they're, some women don't consider themselves when they're going to do anything. What are some ways that they can slowly start you know, using their voice so they don't have that big explosion. To really look at little bitty ways. So I like to break things down into itty bitty baby steps. And so it may be that you you do things like at the the grocery store that if somebody, I don't know, usually you wouldn't say anything, Mm -hmm. that you just say, okay, I'm going to practice right here. And it might be messy, but... It's with nobody I know, and I'm just going to practice saying something, anything. Um, You can do, find just little instances where you can use your voice and just remind yourself you're practicing. That's the most important thing. You're practicing. And then to always, to start this every day asking yourself, what would you like, sweetheart? What would you like? What would serve you, sweetheart? What do you want, sweetheart? To start that, that gentle voice in relationship to yourself, where you're inviting yourself to come forward. Because really, speaking your truth starts with telling yourself the truth and listening to what you want, what you crave, and being willing to name it to yourself and then slowly start to practice asking for it in the external world. And and understanding, this is challenging, but even if you want something and you know what your needs are, it doesn't mean the world's going to give it to you. Yeah. But there's something incredible about being able to speak your need, even if it isn't met. It's a gift to yourself. And then you're at choice. What do you do next? Then you're honoring your voice, you know? Exactly. And, exactly. And, and that feels so good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. It's not my mind, but it's not it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and hey, I know. I mean, everyone has to start from somewhere, and I used to not honor my voice, so I get it, you know, and, and I would have these blow-ups, and then I would be really aggressive because I'm always a warrior, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there anything that I, I think, it? Yeah, and I think for people who are, you know, for women who are learning to do this, maybe it's like, how can I be softer? How can I approach this in a different way? Yeah. Yeah, and how can I be softer with myself and stay with the messiness of the process, knowing that you're learning, just like you, you wouldn't expect yourself to just get up one day and start playing the piano. Mm, no. You know you have to practice your chords and, and learn how to hold your fingers. And it's the same thing with finding your voice or breaking old patterns. Is There's a process. And really, how are we going to be in relationship with ourselves during the process? Are we going to judge ourselves and beat ourselves up? Well, then we don't want to try. But if you go, that was a good mistake. Okay, try again, sweetie. Mm-hmm. Then there's more motivation. You know, I remind women if if you were going to teach a child how to walk, what are the qualities you would bring to that child as you're teaching them to walk? And, you know, we would say, oh, I bring my, my patience, my compassion, my, you know, I'd make sure that it was a safe space for them. I would choose them. Well, that's exactly how we want to be in relationship to ourselves. We want to create a safe place so that we can practice falling down and getting back up again and bring that sense of cheerleading. You've got things on here. You're doing great. That's what will help create the most change in our lives is when we show up for ourselves and then also start pulling in other people that show up and are curious about who we're becoming. Mm. Now, I know that you work with a lot of moms as well. Do they have to master, you know, being a warrior goddess in order to raise a, a daughter who's a warrior goddess? They need to be themselves and be doing the work of becoming more conscious. But 
this, I think moms, where I see a lot of moms suffer is they have this idea they have to be perfect moms. And they can easily take something like, oh, now I have to be a warrior goddess mother. Okay, what does that mean? And use that against yeah. themselves. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. It's like, oh, this is another other to-do to to list, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And to, to just be in process and love, love yourself and empower your daughters by being honest. Like, when you make a mistake, share that you made a mistake. But don't beat yourself up about it. And tell them, you're going to make mistakes, too, and it's okay. And you're great the way you are. And then to, to be working on becoming more comfortable with with ourselves. So moms, like, to put the focus on how do I get comfortable in my own skin? How do I empower myself? How do I become a role model? And I'd be a role model in the process of becoming, not like I have to be there already. Mm-hmm. But I think daughters, I've talked to a lot of daughters because I've been doing – a lot of daughter moms have been showing up at workshops, which has been spectacular. Oh, and yeah. the daughters are reflecting to their moms. They're like, just being in your process and being honest about it is the best gift to us ever. Oh, my goodness. And I'm not trying to be perfect. Yeah. So it's love the process. You just have to love that, especially when the daughters are giving the mom advice because they're so oh connected God. still, so you know? <laughs> yeah, yes. So, so emotionally beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And we, we need to keep cultivating communities of women that support us and that see us for who we're becoming. And I, you know, especially if, if you're in a situation, anybody who's listening that's in a difficult situation with their family or at work, and you feel like you don't have the support you'd like to have, then it's even more important to get outside support, to not try and force your family to be your support system, but to let them be who they are and go find other women and communities and and inspiration that will support you in stepping into the woman you're meant to be. Well, I know that you have communities that do the warrior God, goddess wisdom like, and they do weekends and they have you've got different events that women can attend to be part of a community of like-minded women. Yeah, I'm really passionate about that. And so I travel around country and teach weekend workshops and one days and there's also a lot of book clubs. So there's warrior goddess book clubs all over the country now. Mm-hmm. And I've also been training facilitators because I want women to have local communities. So there's there's where you got as facilitators creating communities all over the world now, which is really exciting and beautiful because we need physical other women to be around, yeah. I believe. Yeah. That that interaction, that personal interaction makes such a huge yeah. difference. You know? It does. And learning how to be vulnerable with each other and support each other and really listen and play. Yeah. So so valuable. It helps keep us all accountable in, you know, to ourselves. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what we want to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I was just absolutely loved your book, Warrior Goddess Training. I know you have a companion book that goes with this. You've got workshops. Um, and so with everything that's there, do you have, like, a way other women can connect with you if they also want to do, let's say, their they're maybe doing all these things and they're just, gosh, they want to spend more time with you. They want to do, you know, like personal training with you. Do you do that? I do. I have, I don't do one-on-one coaching right now, but I do Mm -hmm. have a nine-month online apprenticeship circle, which is exquisite. Mm -hmm. And I chose nine months because it's about the birthing cycle. So it's a support system for women to rebirth themselves over a nine-month process within a community. And they, I, I do classes once a week with that group, and um, they come to workshops, and it's it's really lovely. So that's one way. And I also have a gazillion podcasts and videos and, and in the process of creating a lot more classes online things as well. So... And, yeah, be part of that and uh, connect with you with all that good stuff. And so I, I know we've been talking about it. So where can – what's the, your website that women can connect with you for all this great stuff? The website is heatherashamara.com, all one word. And 
Yeah, and the other thing that, that I have is I do something called a daily spark, which is I send an email out every day as an inspiration. Mm-hmm. And so that's a sweet way for people to plug in and get a little love note every morning. Well, I have signed up for that, and I highly suggest our listeners do as well and go get your book, Warrior Goddess Training, and the companion book with this and be part of your community. I mean, my gosh, it just really takes – had I met you like 10 years ago, I think I'd be in a totally different place. I probably would be a little bit more, um, you know, um like you know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but you know Heather Ash thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today you're so welcome it's delightful and many blessings to you and thanks for all the good work that you do in the world well thank you Heather Ash it's been such an honor to spend this time with you well that's the end of our time for today I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in you've been listening to Moments with Marianne and remember Make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.